researchers and archaeologists to keep an eye out for physical evidence of these places and enlighten attendees on methods to record possible locations. This presentation will review previous research methods and modern technologies to help pinpoint these lost cemetery locations with a focus on Travis County's archaeological resources. Jenny McWilliams' position at THC includes answering inquiries about cemetery access issues, maintenance, law, and the preservation, protection, and recording of historic cemeteries. She also manages the Historic Texas Cemetery Designation Program, as well as the THC's Online Historic Sites Atlas. Prior to her work at THC, Jenny was an archaeologist for cultural resource management firms in Texas. As part of her 20-year archaeological career, Jenny traveled extensively throughout Texas, often excavating graves for relocation for clients such as TexDOT, Lignite Mining Companies, and a reservoir project. Jenny received her undergraduate degree from Southwest Texas State University and her master's degree from Texas Tech University. Jenny was raised in College Station and she currently lives in Austin. Okay, Jenny. Well, that just about sums it up. I think, I think we're done. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, are we recording yet? Uh, yes, we are recording, and okay. also I, I was going to get you to check screen sharing, which you already did that. It looks fine to me, so uh, okay. uh, it's all yours. We are recording. Take care. Okay. Let's see. Which screen is my camera coming from? Let's do this one. All right. Huh. The pictures cover the notes. All right, now we're good. All right, um, I'm gonna ask everybody to please mute your microphones um, so that I can uh, get started. I wanted to say thanks a lot for everybody um, joining me tonight. Um, the purpose of this talk is to share the THC's work in recording cemeteries, along with sharing some of the experiences that I've learned as an archaeologist um, that have helped me understand historic cemeteries. Secondarily, I'm gauging interest in people like you who might be drawn into researching and locating um, and recording um, cemeteries uh, to join a group similar to the THC's Archaeology Steward Network um, to carry out this work. This um, is the very early stages of something that might happen in the years to come. Uh, as a side note, I'm also practicing for a webinar. This will be recorded in the future um, as a webinar um, to be presented on the Texas Historical Commission's website. So why do we want to find lost cemeteries? Of course, we're interested in finding lost history and everything that that history represents. Uh, they are documentations of settlement patterns, of homesteads, rural communities, ghost towns. They reveal information about religion, lifestyles, and genealogies. We also want to find them ahead of development. We can't save something if we don't know where it is. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the cemetery program for context, and then we'll, we'll get into the, the thick of the presentation. In the early 1980s, um, an architect named Garen Height worked for the Texas Historical Commission, and people would call the THC asking cemetery questions, and nobody knew the answers. They would just give them to Garen because Garen was interested in headstones and fencing. And eventually, um, he became sort of a pro at it and went to the legislature with the THC and asked for a, a program for the Texas Historical Commission um, Cemetery Preservation Program. And that was granted um, in the late 1980s. Uh, by 1998, the THC had added the Historic Texas Cemetery Designation Program. And that is what my cohort here pictured Car Carlin Hammonds specializes in that program. In the early 2000s is when this story really begins. The, this is the development of the Atlas. This is when the archaeologists who, um, uh, all of us who use the atlas, um, 
this is when they started populating it. In the beginning of the 2000s, they started with over 4,000 USGS maps and they digitized every cemetery on the maps. That took about two years. At the same time, there was archival research being conducted. That research led to a field survey program called the RIP, which stands for Record, Investigate, Protect. Um, and then they also did research for TxDOT for some proposed interstates. They ran out of money. And so a lot of what I'm doing now is literally taking up the baton from their work in 2000 to 2005 and trying to start it again, trying to start where they left off. Um, how can we build on this previous research? As I mentioned, we are a cemetery uh, preservation team of two. Carlin and I answer phone calls, um, all of the information that Nick just read. Um, and we also work on legal filings and um, we file things like removal of remains. We help the archaeology division with review and compliance projects specific to cemeteries. Um, and we also work with the, the legislature to um, make suggest changes to the health and safety code. But for the past five to seven years, I have been working on a vicinity layer of the atlas. And that is, again, what we're building on. This is uh, or, or where we're going from the previous research. These were locations um, that basically got left off the map because they didn't know exactly where these cemeteries were located. So today we're going to be talking about site development. How do they, in archaeological terms, how, how did that site come to be? We're going to talk about how do cemeteries get lost. We're going to talk a lot about the atlas and these new um, vicinity circles that I have been digitizing. Um, and then we're also going to talk, of course, about what I call three steps um, to research, locate, and record cemeteries. And just, just to give it away, um, what's coming down, down the pipeline is uh, basically review what's already been done. And the next step to locating lost cemeteries would be narrowing the geographic area. This can be done by deed research. It can be done by studying the landscape, interviewing um, or oral histories, understanding the, the layout of the, of the land that the people had access to. Then there's the survey aspect, which is the boots on the ground, um, which requires gaining landowner permission and um, looking for the signs of, of lost cemeteries and then recording the cemetery either through archaeological site forms, legal notices, or through a historic Texas cemetery designation. Site development. Um, so obviously in the early years of uh, settlement of Texas, cemeteries were on people's farms, on their ranches. They were primarily, or the majority of them were rural. Um, as the populations increased and for health reasons, we started grouping our cemeteries outside of towns, primarily away from our water sources, so that the farmers weren't burying the dead near their wells or cisterns. At the same time, um, in the 1880s, the popularity of this philanthropic idea of donating land uh, came about. And that's where, in so many of the deeds, we find I so-and-so donate one acre of land for a school, non-denominational church, and cemetery. And that was a big movement around the 1880s all the way up into the 1920s or 30s. Um, then later, as time went on, also starting around the 1880s, the urban city cemeteries were starting these um, large formal planned cemeteries outside of town. So how do cemeteries get lost? Some of these actions are passive. They're simply the result of historic change, just um, how history plays out. But some of the actions are more intentional. Passive or unintentional actions might be that the population moves with the railroad and later it moves again with the interstates. In the South between 16, uh, 1916 and 1970, more than 6 million African-Americans moved in the Great North Migration 
and they they left Texas uh, for work opportunities relating to World War I and also to escape these Jim Crow laws. That led to a lot of loss of specifically African-American cemeteries. Change in our culture is another sort of passive, unintentional way that we have lost our cemeteries. Um, the literal dying off of cemetery associations uh, the end of an era of going home for family reunions for what used to be called Decoration Day and annual cleanups. Some more active ways that we lose our cemeteries is actually removal of cemeteries from the USGS map. This is research that Ashley Lemke did um, for the Texas Historical Commission in about uh, 2000. Cemeteries also drop off the deed records. We're going to see that down the line here. Um, landowners not allowing access for people to maintain their cemeteries, that leads to overgrowth and eventually the loss of collective memory of where that cemetery is. Moving headstones. Now, sometimes uh, we've heard, I've heard a lot of stories of landowners moving headstones, um, throwing them in a creek, throwing the headstones in a well, bulldozing them over to the edge of a field so that they could use that land or sell that land or hide that cemetery. Um, and, but then there's also another aspect to that. We've found in commissioner court records that sometimes the headstones were removed literally because they didn't believe there was anything left of the burials. Now, archaeologists who have excavated human burials that go back 12, 15, 20,000 years know, or much longer in other places, know that those bones don't disappear and there's quite a bit of information still to be found in the ground. The next um, thing I'm going to show you is a little vignette. Um, and some of the people here in Travis County might know, uh, might be able to think about it, a cemetery that they're familiar with that follows this vignette. It's in Longview Park, and it's where a family of uh, people who were killed in a 1921 tornado are buried. So let's say there's a community, and it has a school, it's also used for a non-denominational church, and they start using the burial ground. Now, the family in the lower left, they're wealthy, and they have a very well-maintained plot that's um, pretty prestigious. Other people don't have as, um, as nice of markers. Maybe they're wooden, maybe they're temporary. Maybe they only mark the graves of uh, travelers or um, people who didn't have any family. Um, and the cemetery evolves like this around this little school. So we, you and I see that the cemetery is this huge one acre of land and, and all the different sides and corners are used for different purposes, for different churches, different families, um, or different ethnicities, uh, but it all is all one cemetery. What would we see today? we would see the very well fenced and maintained wealthy cemetery. Maybe this headstone um, is kind of hidden by this tree over here. All of these poppers are, are in this thick grassy area that nobody, nobody has any memory of people being buried. And then these other people who are buried up in the top, the only rec recollection we have of that or the only sign we have of that, those people burials are this line of trees that marked the old corner of the original one acre of land. Moving on, we're going to talk about how do we find these cemetery locations. Again, we're going to reconcile uh, cemetery listings. We're going to check the atlas. Um, we're going to narrow the geographic area. We're going to survey and then where we're going to record them. Unfortunately, first I have to go through some laws, which can be dull, but I'm going to go through them very quickly because I'm going to provide a place for you to find them. All graves are protected equally under the Texas Health and Safety Code and through the Texas Antiquities Code. But what defines, what is this, this cemetery defined as? For that we go, like I said, to the Texas Health and Safety Code, they're protected by both statutory and case law. So they're both in the um, 
in the, the legislature approves these um, codes. And then case law tries, tries out little, little bits of, of holes in the law where um, something's not quite clear. So we also follow case law. Uh, cemetery law is also found in the penal code, the administrative code, the government code. In fact, I did a search and there are 57 different codes that list the word cemetery. So cemetery law is very confusing. But we're just gonna go over parts of it. And again, these can be found in RTHC's Preserving Historic Cemeteries handout along with other information about cemeteries. So a grave is a space of ground that is contain, uh, that contains interred, intentionally interred human remains or a burial park that is used or intended to be used for interment of human remains in the ground. Intended to be used is very important when we start talking about the deeds. Just because the land was set aside, that makes it a cemetery, even if it was never used for graves. And the human remains means the body of a decedent. This can be challenging, um, but that's what the law says, the body of a decedent. A cemetery, oh, sorry about that. Um, property is to be considered to be dedicated as a cemetery if one or more human remains um, are present, human burials are present on that, on that land, or if the cemetery is dedicated for cemetery use and recorded in the deed. No particular instrument, uh, record, or ceremony is required, just the presence of that grave, that burial in the ground is sufficient for the dedication. Once the property is dedicated, it cannot be used for any other purpose unless the dedication is removed by the district court. Uh, there is a process for removal of remains, um, but until those remains are removed, that land cannot be developed and it can't be used for any other purpose. Neither the THC, uh, the THC does not have law enforcement um, authority. So if any of these laws are broken, uh, we can provide guidance and support, but we need to ask you to go to local law enforcement to um, to look into it. Um, so if I could see y'all, how many of y'all uh, work with the Atlas? Are you familiar? Are most people familiar with the Atlas? That's what I was thinking my, my group would be tonight. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through this. Now I can see all of y'all. That's awesome. Um, the Atlas contains about 15,000 um, cemeteries right now, uh, but only about 11,500 are plotted in the Atlas. Um, I just looked up real quick that Travis County, for Travis County, we have 231 cemeteries, of which 33 do not have exact locations. And there will be an upcoming uh, webinar on how to use the Atlas. Um, I know that some of the stewards are trained in how to use the Atlas but we're hoping to do a, a shorter, shorter version of it for um, specific to cemeteries. So the atlas is just like any county planners maps. Um, it's the state's cultural resource map. It helps preservationists and government based um, government, government contracted uh, land use planners identify locations to avoid um, destruction of these historic and prehistoric sites. And they do this ahead of time, um, again, to avoid destruction. Also, the identification of these cemeteries, uh, these resources really saves the taxpayer money. Uh, Sugarland 95 is actually a really good example, uh, which we'll be hearing about next week. It, um, Think about the money that it cost uh, to one, plan where they were gonna put a school. They, they drew up all the plans, then they found the graves, then they had to excavate the graves, store the grave, the grave goods, analyze the graves, and then now they're putting them back in the ground. Um, so some of what we're doing, if, if, if you're not interested in history, maybe you're interested in, in saving taxpayer money. The building blocks of the Atlas uh, started, like I said, um, in about 2000 when they 
digitized all of the cemeteries on the USGS map. Then they did archival surveys, which were really like going to um, the old county inventories. They were not archival surveys like uh, some of us might consider. Then there was the record, uh, investigate, protect, RIP surveys, the boots on the ground is what they like to call it. Um, we also have eight historic Texas cemetery designations. That, that information gets stored um, in our databases and is, some of it is available on the atlas. And now with my research, we have these new county inventories where we list uh, the cemeteries we know about and the cemeteries we don't know about. We also add to the atlas um, cemeteries that are reported through notice of existence and cemeteries that are reported through another legal form called the notice of unverified um, cemetery or grave. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that towards the end. And finally, we have cemeteries that are recorded as archeological sites. The only thing I wanted to show you on this slide is that if you find an error within the cemetery portion of the atlas, you can use this button here, report an error. To me, um, I don't wanna do all of the reconciliation through this error, report an error. I have better ways to do it than that. But if you find a misspelling or a misplotting or something like that, if you send a report an error to this message, it will come straight to me. So again, the archival research um, that was conducted in between 2000 and 2005 consisted of paper USGS maps, of which I have some right around me, um, and Word documents. They would um, describe the cemetery in the Word document, and then I come along and I create um, the cemetery. If it's not already created, I create it, and I add their notes um, here to, to sort of track what we know about that cemetery. So the first step in locating uh, or identifying these lost cemeteries is, is kind of, uh, like I said, reconciliation. What do they know at the county level? And what do we know at the state level? And are we all agreeing? In Travis County, I worked with Dale Flatt, um, who was using notes and, and also went to sites with the late Devon Woods. Um, Bob Ward was involved and um, Kay Boyd um, is an archivist and um, historian who provides a lot of the genealogy um, background for the cemeteries in, in the city of Austin. And this is a group of preservationists called Save Austin Cemeteries. So I was piggybacking on their research as well as the research that I had from the RIP survey and the archival uh, research that was collected. And so I take all that information and I do a big old mashup in an Excel uh, spreadsheet. And I sort through sort of the known and the unknown. Um, and so, this is the first phase in identifying these lost cemeteries. What do we not know? Um, in this, also in this first phase, I'd be asking people to um, look at the atlas and see what kind of other mistakes are in there. Look for common mistakes, correct um, directions, fill in the numbers of graves in use. Let's get a little bit of data on, on these cemeteries. And that's just cleaning up the atlas. The second flush is more the identification of the vicinity. Um, what, what might, which cemeteries are lost? What do we know about them? And how can we prioritize what needs to happen next? Which ones are the most threatened? And uh, where we need to, to move. I show this slide because I want you to see, although we, we do have a lot of cemeteries that just have unknown. It's probably called the, the Reutersville Cemetery, uh, but maybe this one's the old Reutersville Cemetery. I don't know. So they couldn't name, uh, when they were looking at these USGS maps, they didn't always have a name for the cemetery. So one of the things we're asking um, when we clean up these cemetery inventories is to, to identify the names of the cemetery. As you can see here, this says something, but we don't, we don't know what. This is what the, um, the person who was digitizing these USGS maps had, had problems with. 
often, uh, well, not often, actually, we get pet cemeteries that are digitized. Well, those are not protected by law. And then we get a lot of little isolated graves that are, are digitized that are very, very hard to see. So all of these things need to be kind of cleaned up um, just to make sure that we're all starting from the same point. Speaking of, of maps, so all, a lot of our res early research was based on USGS maps. Well, about that same time, Ashley Lemke uh, was an intern at the THC and um, she was given the job of going through kind of, kind of like me, hey, we've got all of these maps, we wanna get rid of them, what can you learn from them? So she examined 245 historic maps, primarily USGS maps. And these maps were dated from about 1887 to 1960. Um, when she looked at these maps, she found, uh, they were mostly in the, the southern part of the, uh, Texas. When she looked at these maps, she found in some places in this 1948 map, she sees this cemetery here. But then she goes to a later map Oh no, I cut and paste the wrong picture. Boy, that's bad. It's gone. So in the later map, there is no cemetery showing there. And what she found is that these um, locations are primarily of cemeteries of either African American or Hispanic heritage. And so really marginalized populations are literally, <laughs> their the cemeteries are literally falling off the map. Um, I'll be working with interns this fall to uh, identify all of the lost cemeteries along the border, border wall um, to see if we can find more examples uh, building on Ashley's work. So then I come along and I have about 4,000 of these maps that were supposed to be thrown away. I started looking to make sure they were on the atlas and lo and behold, many of them were not. The, an intern went through these 4,000 maps and marked an X wherever there was a cemetery on the atlas, one, two, three, and drew a very large circle, actually she's the black circle, around the cemeteries that were not on the atlas. You can see from this quick example that there, there were a lot. In fact, there were about 12 um, 1,200 cemeteries so far that I've mapped, and I still have maybe two counties to go. Sometimes I was able to determine whether the vicinities were close or, or not close. Down here, you can see this one's pretty far off, but it's in, in the same, you know, neck of the woods, whereas some of them were much closer. As I entered these uh, vicinities, I would build um, sort of a background of history. Uh, I, I plotted it based on this reason and here's all the background history from previous um, researchers or emails or that sort of thing. So next I want to talk, this, this is about finding cemeteries through mapping. Next I want to talk about finding cemeteries through, um, through the deed records. Uh, this was created, these graphics were created by Lanny Audison, who is joining us from Alaska. And he followed these deeds, this paper trail, um, to figure out a pretty complex scenario. And this is really just to show you that in the beginning, uh, this cemetery was right here. It was excluded uh, when, this, when Bob Ward here sold his land to me. Thank you, Bob. Um, the land was surveyed and it saved and accepted this small hole called, um, which is the cemetery. And I'm going to go through these very quickly because I don't, I don't need to, to drag on about it, but as the land sold off to Dale Flat, the cemetery was not mentioned in, in, on his, even though he shared a, a side with the cemetery, it wasn't mentioned. Again, we split it again. It's not mentioned. Again, we split it again. On this one, it is excluded. On this one, 
even though it shares this side here, it's not mentioned on the beads and on and on until it becomes this island. And eventually Lanny Otteson owns it all. Um, but he doesn't really know that he owns a cemetery in the middle. I think this is a great example of how cemeteries get lost. Um, just to show you here in Austin, this is um, the Tannehill Cemetery and two of the graves were moved to the Texas State Cemetery, but we still don't know if there are more graves um, behind this person's house. The next part of locating um, un unmarked or, uh, lost cemeteries is reading the landscape and this is where I think archaeologists are going to have the most fun. I say leave the deed research up to people who enjoy it. Historians call up Lanny um, and, and uh, it, if it's what's keeping you from being interested in cemeteries, don't let it hold you back. Ask for help. Find somebody who's very good at looking at the deed records and doing that for you and go to the fun part, which might be the same way that we study prehistoric sites. Uh, we study them by looking, uh, we look for them by reading the landscape. Um, where would an occupation site be? What, what, what kind of landscape, where would they be near the water? Um, what was available culturally? Um, what kind of land could, did they have access to? And what's the timeline of this occupation? What, what was around them at that time? The uh, Google Earth is amazing. Um, I hope everybody knows that you can go backwards in time by clicking this uh, little icon of a clock here and you can drag it back sometimes even to the 1940s or 50s, but usually more like the 80s. Um, but at least you can use it to see uh, different lay, uh, vegetation. Um, you can see, start to see patterns. Anytime I'm looking for a cemetery and I find a clump of trees in the middle of a plowed field, I have to ask myself, why is that there? In this particular case, uh, this is a cemetery and the only thing I knew about it was this big vicinity circle and that it, um, it had been maintained in, I can't remember what year, I'll, maybe the 1990s or so. So I start scrolling through and, you know, it's not, where is it? Is it, is it here? Is it here? I don't really know. Well, there it is. It got cleaned up and it's pristine. It's a little too clean maybe, but there it is. We can see it from, um, from, from the air. And here it is again. Again, you can see through the vegetation in different views. So using Google Earth is by far much easier than tromping around in the woods. Always do your research ahead of time. There's no reason to go looking for these sites. If, um, if you haven't done your research, found out what other people know first, um, know your deeds and um, know the history of the land. So the boots on the ground, the archeology, span aspect of, is um, possibly one of the more interesting aspects of this. So um, you'll need land access, obviously. You'll need some ability to converse with landowners. Um, know about their, um, sorry, I just got a, an announcement. So this is for the possibly the more chit chatty people that want to go out and um, see if a landowner will let you come onto their land to look at the cemetery. I am going to go over some access laws here too. And what you'll be looking for is obviously features, um, a little game I like to play called push pile or a grave, and then uh, vegetation. And again, after I go over this, we're going to talk about ways to record this, record cemeteries, and then we'll be ready for questions. So who owns a cemetery? A surrounding landowner may have title to the land, but they are restricted with what they can do with that land by statute and common law. The cemetery can't be destroyed, it can't be used for any other purpose, and the landowner cannot prohibit access. The access law in the health and safety code says that any person who wishes to visit a cemetery, and it says any person, it doesn't say a descendant, uh, ha 
has the right to access that cemetery. However, the landowner has their right too. They can designate a route and they can designate reasonable hours and um, the visitor must provide written notice to the, to the owners um, and it might have to be 14 days um, from, the, from the date, the time of the, the visit. So recording cemeteries, we have a couple of different options. We can use um, the filing record of abandoned or unknown cemetery that says that if a person who discovers an unknown or abandoned cemetery will file this notice uh, with the county clerk. So that makes it a public document um, and concurrently email, uh, mail the landowner on record in the county appraisal district. Again, um, I don't think I'm, I neglect, I think I know neglected to mention that you are going to the appraisal district to find out who owns this property. When you're filing uh, this notice, it's pretty simple. You give uh, directions um, and how is it evidenced? What do you see? Uh, there's some, on this one, there's some rails and a, a sign that says Hawkins cut into it. And then you list the legal, descri legal description. Um, I say to put as much information in this recording as you possibly can. Uh, go ahead and um, add excerpts from old deeds, publications, historic maps. Go ahead and make it like, um, like a report. Um, as much information as you can. This is what you're giving to the, the clerk's office to show that um, you're pretty dang sure there's a cemetery there. More recently, in about 2017, uh, the legislature passed a law that defined a new kind of a cemetery. And that's called an unverified cemetery. That is a location that has some evidence of an interment, but the presence of those exact grave locations hasn't been verified by a professional. And that profession, those professionals are considered um, to be cemetery keepers, licensed funeral directors, medical examiners, um, coroners, and luckily they finally did add professional archaeologists. So when would you use this unverified cemetery? Um, I have gotten them for, for good reasons and I've gotten them for not so good reasons, but in general, uh, my best example is um, a grave with a headstone and an iron marker, um, fairly large and maintained. Uh, it ended up that, that they interviewed the previous landowner and he said, yes, that's my horse. Um, that's Chuck's grave. And so they went ahead and filed a notice of unverified cemetery that says, um, we know this is here. It, yes, it looks like a grave, but uh, we interviewed Chuck and, or we inter interviewed uh, the landowner and he says that this is a horse grave. And we go ahead and put these on the atlas because we want, if, if another archaeologist comes by and sees that, we want them to know it's already been recorded, it's a horse grave, move along. Another example of when unverified cemetery um, notice might be useful is say a headstone leaning against a tree or on the, along the fence line of a plowed field you don't know where those graves actually are. It's very likely that somebody moved that headstone against the tree or on the fence line just to get it out of the way, but it could be anywhere in, in the vicinity. So that's another example of um, a good use for unverified cemetery form. So again, in the health and safety code, it says that a person who discovers an unverified cemetery shall file this notice um, and concurrently send notice to the landowner. Um, one thing I do like to point out is, is these are laws. They're, they're not really optional. Uh, a lot of archaeologists don't do this, um, and I think a lot of avocationals don't know about it. Uh, this is something that the law says that we need to be doing. Uh, it's helpful. Um, I appreciate it. I do understand that there are times where landowners might not want this recorded on their land. But if you know it's a cemetery, you need to record it.
jumping around a little bit, um, I another way to record cemeteries is um, by recording them as archaeological sites. And I go back and forth on this. Uh, this was something when I came into the cemetery program, I wasn't really sure about either. I would say that if you're doing an archaeological investigation, if you're trenching, if you're mapping, um, if, if you're doing in anything, uh, ground penetrating radar, anything that you're collecting data on that you would want available, and especially if it's in on public land. So if it's a city owned cemetery, then the um, then the archaeological site form is a is a good way to record that and have those notes and records stored. I did a search of the atlas looking for the word cemetery and I came up with 74 archaeological sites that had the word cemetery grave or burial in them. Um, you have to watch with the word grave because gravel and is in just about every archaeological site form in the state. So we got those got rid of those and we were left with cemet uh, 24 cemetery features. Out of those, I was able to discover um, two brand new or never recorded on, on the, um, the atlas, uh, two new cemetery features and 14 vicinity features. So these, um, going through these old site forms was, was pretty interesting. A lot of the 74 simply mentioned the word cemetery, like turn left at this cemetery. So those, those, um, those fell out of the, the pool. Um, let's see, where's my timer? 42 minutes. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty much wrapping up. I'm going, I'm going to leave this slide here um, so that you can you can go to our THC website on cemeteries. You can find the laws here. You can download the, the preservation pamphlet there. Um, and this is just a good, good starting resource. And I'm going to switch views um, to start taking questions. So if anyone and everyone wants to remove their uh, microphone, their unsilence your microphones and we'll see what people think. I did. What's your name? Hey Jenny. Yes. Okay. This is Robin Matthews. I have a question, a couple of questions. Okay. Have relatives that have about a section of land. Mm, East of Lampasas, sort of northeast of Lampasas. On that property is an old cut limestone house. And there are three fields there of considerable size. There's a cistern, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. We have no clue if there is anybody buried on that piece of property. So what I want to do is contact my worthless cousin who owns it and see if I can do a little walkabout. And if I find something suspicious, I should contact you. You can either file a notice of unverified right off the bat. Um, you can do some deed research and see if a cemetery was ever listed on the land. Um, or, or had your friend do the deed research. And, um, and, and then it will just be an unknown, really, until there's some, some threat or right. until somebody has the money to um, hire an archeologist to scrape and, and look for the grave. Okay, on, on a single grave, um, how much land around the grave is considered a grave site? Only the grave, where, and an extent of the graves, wherever they are, unless it's written in a deed that it's an acre or two acres or five acres. Okay. Um, do, so it's where, where the graves are or do, where it was set aside. 
Okay. Let's say I wanted to bury my ashes on the said property I mentioned earlier. Should I set aside a, a normal grave space or just a little hole in the ground? Well, your ashes are not protected under the health and safety code. So well, that's kick in the face. Okay. So <laughs> um, I've, I've had phone calls uh, from several relatives of, of um, deceased family members who want to go visit their, um, their interred ashes they're, and, and they are, they're not allowed and there's no part in the law that, that would allow them to visit. Even, even though the ashes sometimes have bone fragments. That's right. After, um, it's just considered uh, not even human anymore after um, it's broken down to that degree. Hmm. What's okay. interesting is under the Antiquities Code, it is not the same. Prehistoric it is what? Sites, not the same. Okay. Prehistoric sites do consider um, the, the ashes uh, to be um, an intentional interment. That's weird. So that would take a, a legislative action? Which part? Uh, to... to uh, reclassify modern ashes as a cemetery plot that would take leg legislation? I'll, I'll say this by saying, first of all, I'm not an attorney and this is not legal counsel. Um, <laughs> but, and I have to say that often. <laughs> yeah. But um, from my understanding, um, the ashes are, 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 cremains are not protected. Okay. But, but Jenny, they'd be protected if they were interred on a designated or, or dedicated cemetery. So if I could, I designate say a five by five yes. meter plot on my land for yes. Robin's ashes, and yes. thereafter any of Robin's descendants could come visit. Yes, and and then it is it's through the deed that that okay. it is set aside. Correct. So your front front yard, Leslie. That sounds good. Yes, you you come pick mm -hmm. a. Pick a spot and Jenny will tell us how big a place we've got to do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jenny, I have a question for you then. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, when, when you're dealing with a designated uh, cemetery, that um, it can't be used for any other purpose. And I know that even, even includes uh, grazing uh, cattle and what have you. But now when you get into the vicinity um, cemetery, um, how, how, would a, how would a landowner uh, be able to not graze uh, or you know, what, what kind of legal implications would, would carry uh, in that case? So if somebody filed a notice of unverified cemetery, and said that I think that there's um, a cemetery out here. What happens is that doesn't go to the clerk's office. That form actually goes to the Texas Historical Commission where the archeology span uh, division reviews it and says, um, oh, you're right, this is a push pile. It's quite plain. We see all the evidence there. This is on top of um, rock. There's no way that this is, this is a burial or, or whatever evidence that, that maybe the landowner presented or that sort of thing. Um, so we would then sort of take, take that off the books um, as a cemetery. Um, now, if it goes the other way and there's evidence that says that these four marked graves are indeed, you know, combined with the history, um, these four marked places that may be graves combined with the history that these people, there were four graves, they were buried on this land um, and it all matches, uh, the Texas Historical Commission may go ahead and say that that is indeed a cemetery. Um, these laws really haven't been around that long for us to um, to have a lot of examples. Mm -hmm. so, so how culpable is a landowner when, when uh, I mean, how is he going to keep his animals from grazing uh, if there's not a fence around it, or is, is a landowner required to put a fence? If he knows, um, he shouldn't allow his, his animals to trample it. But um, 
I think the question is also who's who's enforcing the law? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Of course, yeah. Right. Does he know? Is it intentional? And then you get into the nitty gritty. Okay. I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, you and I have talked about a small cemetery in South Austin, and I'm about to meet with the landowner to discuss options. Mm -hmm. One of the first things he's going to say is, well, I don't know how to straighten a stone. I don't know how to fix that kind of a fence. Do you have contacts, people that know how to do that sort of thing? Yes, I do. Um, we have a contractor's list that I can send you easily. Excellent. How do I stop sharing? Ah, oh, there. Uh, Kathy has a question, Jenny. Okay. Yeah, I was curious, uh, how many slave cemeteries did you find? I don't expect them to be very well marked. Right. A lot of the notes were for slave cemeteries. A lot of the notes were that's a lot of the notes from the 2000 to 2005 research said, and there is a slave cemetery somewhere on the land or, and there is a slave cemetery adjacent to this cemetery, but not where. So yes, there were a, a lot that mentioned um, the word. Um, so we, we don't really know. And, and, you know, I haven't done a lot of analysis on the 1200 um, cemeteries that I've, I've identified at this point, partially because I'm still doing it. And because as soon as I, I think I'm done, I'm going to start looking for them. So um, I really haven't done that much analysis on um, the types of cemeteries that they are. Hey, Jenny, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I think I have one of those 25 <clears throat> and um, either that or it's a new one <laughs> um, to add to your list. Uh, it was one of those that was recorded, if I remember correctly, as an archaeological site rather than having the green kind of plot around it. Um, the one of our local guys and landowner confirmed that the metal like uh, fencing around it is still extent and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what you see in Atlas is not everything and I don't know how I'm supposed to get a hold of the rest of the what information was recorded about it but I'm planning a visit out there to um, to the site to document it mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so what I was I ask because of that was if something's considered one of those archaeological sites as opposed to like a cemetery, which just gets into the, you know, and as an aside, it is kind of like iffy, you know, without applying one of the criteria as far as in, in a federal, from a federal point of view, that could be kind of hairy. But anyways, um, how do I know if the county has this reported to them? Just because it was recorded in the 70s as a site, if I remember correctly, it was recorded in the 70s, I think. I, I seriously doubt it is, although it could be in the deed records. And oh, that was my follow-up question. You've mentioned the deed research a few times. Um, how? <laughs> like, do you just go to the county website and then poke around until you find something that might let you access deeds or? Um, a lot of the deeds aren't scanned. They're actually in books in the courthouse or on, on another, in another county property. Um, deed research is, is a challenge. Uh, you start with either the modern landowner or the original uh, land grant uh, that says so-and-so owned, you know, sections of, of land. And then you, uh, you just follow <laughs> just uh, who they sold it to and who they sold it to and who they sold it to. There's a research uh, named Steph McDougall in Houston who is researching a cemetery in Houston. And she had to read through 99 deeds. Jeez. Because of all those shared, shared uh, pro property owners. So you're, it's, it's the splitting up and, and it wasn't all necessarily exactly for that cemetery, but because some somebody shared a corner or a mention of the cemetery within those 99 deeds. So would I just be better off <laughs> hiring <just> somebody? <laughs> filling out the information uh, as a site record, as a as a site form, and uh, I have to go look up 
your available documents because I have them kind of scattered places. But um, the appropriate forms for notifying THC and the county clerk. That's um, the notice of existence. Notice of existence. Mm -hmm. I thought there was another one. There's like abandoned historic. Yeah, that's notice of existence of abandoned or um, unknown cemetery. That's just one thing. So would you prefer like a new whole new site form or it, to treat it as like a revisit? Like how does Texas do that? I think it would be a revisit and along with the revisit would be a notice of existence. Okay. So deeds are public records, is that correct? Yes. So mm -hmm. theoretically anybody can have access to them if you know what you're looking for and how to yep. get there. Okay. That's right. Oh, what, I've got one more question. Uh, in the, you, you mentioned, uh, somebody asked a very good question about the extent that is protected. Mm -hmm. um, hey. Now, if, um, hey, Jenny, I've got a question. This is Lanny. I want to hear. Oh. Lanny can't hear very well, so we'll let him go and then we'll come back to you, John. Go ahead, Lanny. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I couldn't tell who who was talking there. I think you just said his name, John. Right. Was the uh, cemetery you were describing, was that in Travis County or was that in Burnett? It is in Harrison Oh, that was a different County. person. Different person. Oh. I'm sorry, you broke up there. Is it in Travis County? It's in Harrison County. Harrison, Longview, Harrison. Okay. okay, go ahead, John. Um, okay, got you that problem. Just go ahead. Uh, before you mentioned the, uh, now setting aside X space is set aside as a designated cemetery. If you, the default is the the grave shafts essentially. So it's the human remains it's that either. space of the grave shafts. But if it's being treated in the archaeological context as opposed to this other kind of protected state cemetery kind of context, um what about the fencing, the vegetation, the headstones of the other, can you, can you open it up to the other contributing elements and go beyond the, just the remains and the shaft? Yeah, I would say uh, it's, the law protects the graves, but I, I think it, it could protect all, all of that. Under um, the antiquities code, right? But the Antiquities Code is more for public property. Oh, um, right, right, and, right. And the Health and Safety Code is is everyone. Yeah. And with the cemeteries, they're explicitly like, you know, asked not to be considered, you know, eligible unless you go through all this work of demonstrating it's associated with significant events or persons. Mm -hmm. Or the other two criteria, if you'll. Oh, that's all I had. <laughs> Thanks for answering you know, all my little domino questions. Okay, I have a I have a question again. <clears throat> Let's go. You're familiar with the old Mountain City? Mm -mm. No. Okay. Hayes County. Um, mm the Hayes County football field. Yeah. And then you go north of that 100 yards or a couple hundred yards or so is basically the old Mountain City area. In that area, <clears throat> my great great grandmother was buried on some of the Barton property. And then it was subdivided, blah, 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 and all that. When, when Barton took us to the property, it was out in the middle of the pasture. The grave had a grave uh, headstone and a picket fence around it. 
the picket fence was probably five feet or six feet by seven or eight feet. Somewhere along the way, when the real estate developer got into the area, that picket fence disappeared. <clears throat> Do I have a claim that says somebody needs to restore that picket fence? And then is that picket, and we have pictures, and is that picket fence then the area that is to be respected? That would be a question for an attorney. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, our AG rep, uh, our old AG rep, who's retired, told me that there were two answers to cemetery questions. Call law enforcement or call an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I actually know a lot about that Barton Cemetery. And you know that, I think, was no, it? No, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not the Barton Cemetery. Oh, okay. It is a single plot now in somebody's front yard. Okay. <clears throat> is it on the Atlas? I'm sure it is. It's widely known, but I'll check. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, well it looks like that's everybody's questions, huh? Time to drink. Okay. Jenny, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks for actually, listening. Jenny actually, Pitch. I have oh, one. I just Heather has sorry. a question. Sorry. So is there any way to volunteer to help survey or find these missing cemeteries? Because I would love to do that. I think there will be. Um, I hope that in some amount of time, and the state moves very slow, so this is just now budding as an idea, there will be the what I was talking about, these uh, sort of cemetery stewards. Okay. Um, if you wanted to start on a county other than Travis um, or, or some of the counties that I've already worked with county historical commissions to clean up the data. Um, I'm sure I could find a county that needs to be like reconciled. Okay. But uh, the boots on the ground, um, I don't know when that's going to happen. Okay. Thank you. And Jenny, you're going to let everybody know about this upcoming webinar? Yes, I'll, I'll widely you, distribute it when, uh, if when you I have enough in, guinea pigs. Okay, if you'll get in touch with Leslie, yeah. and then she can um, let uh, everybody know uh, about it. Right. And, uh, okay, so I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in tonight. And um, for sure, uh, We'll see you next month on the 20th, and um, we'll be talking more about cemeteries on that occasion as well. And uh, once again, thank you very much, Jenny. We appreciate your, uh, your time and uh, your efforts. I like to say cemeteries, they're archaeological sites too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks, y'all. Good night. All right. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Leslie. Sir. Uh, I, I don't think I can email this file to you. No. I, I will, but I, I think I can put it on Dropbox and then give you Perfect. access there. I'm Great. And I'll, I'll use QuickTime or something to remove the meeting and go straight to straight to Jenny's program. I didn't start until till she started talking. Last so, you. Oh, yay. Okay. Know, so. Yeah. Great. We'll get that. Nick. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. We'll get that link out then. Thank you. I'll do as soon as I can. Alrighty, good night. Good night. Good night all.